Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad you've joined us for our time in God's Word together as a church family this morning. Uh, as we begin this Christmas season, this Advent season, and our Christmas series this morning, uh, I just want to uh, advise you, remind you of a couple of things that are going on. Uh, first, uh, Wednesday, December the 1st at 7 p.m. Uh, here at the church, we are hosting our annual uh, Christmas memorial service for those families who have lost someone in the last year or two, and just as a way to come and remember, reflect, and, and be encouraged together as we head into this season. And we do this in partnership with Smith's Funeral Home, and that will be here at 7 o'clock, Wednesday, December the 1st. Uh, also on uh, December 19th, Sunday, December 19th at 6.30 p.m., we'll have our carol service, and we're looking forward to that evening of music, of scripture reading together, and uh, we invite you to be with us for that occasion. And of course, every Sunday at 10 a.m., we're here in the church building with uh, our Christmas series as we begin uh, today, so we invite you to be a part of that with us. And I want to thank you this morning for partnering with us in the different opportunities we've had as a church to serve those around us through the, uh, the shoe boxes, your response to the food drive, and also our other projects that we've had trying to help people in our community. Thank you for participating in that. That's just such a blessing to be able to help others, and we appreciate that so much. We also thank you for your continued giving uh, to our ministry here at Harold Baptist, and we're asking our church family if you would uh, just pray about a, a possible gift towards the end of the year here, uh, to help us finish in a strong financial position as the Lord enables you and guides you. And so we encourage you to be praying about that as well. Well, we're about to start our Christmas series here this morning, this Advent season. And so why don't we open in prayer together and then we'll look into the Word of God. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being yours and of belonging to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ as well. And as we gather together around your Word this morning, we bring our hearts to you. We thank you for the invitation to pour our hearts out to you. We pray that you would meet the needs of every heart, every life, whether it is a, a physical need uh, for health, a financial need with so many questions around employment for so many. Uh, Father, whether it is a, a relational need or a spiritual need in our lives where we, we need to see you bring your transforming power of your spirit to bear. Father, would you Guide us, comfort us, encourage us, and lead us forward during these days. Help us now as we look into your word to, to approach this time with the spirit of worship and surrender to you. Help us to come anticipating what you are going to do among us as you speak to us individually and as families, as a church family today. As we listen and look into your word, we pray that you would continue to honor your name in this process and in our response to it. And We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you started listening to Christmas music yet? We, we sure have at our place. Uh, what's your favorite song of the season? Uh, do you have one or is yours just a long list? Uh, I heard a radio uh, broadcaster this week announced that they are going to soon be playing a list of the top 25 favorite songs of the season. And uh, they're going to play that in order, counting down the top 25 favorite songs of the season. And I thought, man, we could probably put that list together right here, right now, in about 30 seconds, couldn't we? There's so many songs that come to mind that are so popular and, and people count on hearing during the course of the Christmas season. Uh, why do we enjoy the, the songs like Winter Wonderland and Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire and White Christmas and whatever else it might be, I'll Be Home for Christmas, all these songs that we love? I think these songs connect with us because they help us to remember something a place, a time, a particular Christmas celebration, a, a period in our life where things just seem to be going maybe so well or, or where that connection seemed so strong. Uh, we remember the people that we gathered with at that time and it helps us to remember. These songs also help us to experience something now. They, they work towards our emotions to help us experience a little lift, a little happiness which is, is real, and yet it is short-lived, and it's just surface. And so that it works for our emotions to encourage us for a moment with that shot of happiness as we remember, as we enjoy these things of the season. It also helps us to anticipate something. It, it encourages us to look forward to this Christmas, this celebra celebration, that gathering. Will it be like that one in the past that we treasure so much? Will it be just like that? Will it be better? Will, will, will there be something missing? Will there be something added? It helps us to look ahead. And so these songs connect with us because they help us to remember something, they help us to experience something, and they help us to anticipate something. 
Well, this Advent season, uh, the word Advent, by the way, remember, just means arrival. Uh, where this is a season looking forward to the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And as we remember his first arrival, we anticipate his second arrival. And so these two things are just completely linked together as we gather this Christmas season. Well, this season we're going to continue our series in the book of Isaiah, looking at our holy God. And as we do, we're going to focus in now on songs, not of the season, but songs of the Son. Songs of the Son. Songs of the Servant of God. These servant songs, as they're called, recorded for us in in Isaiah's book, uh, all point to Jesus. They're about Jesus Christ, and and they help us to remember who he is and what God has done for us. They help us to experience the work of God by calling us to response, and they help us to anticipate the full and final work of God as Jesus returns one day for his own. And so these are the songs we're going to focus on as we come to these passages this Christmas. And these songs will provide a foundation for our celebration, a foundation for our season, a foundation for our hearts and our lives that go back far beyond anything you and I can remember, that go far deeper than any celebration or gift or meal can do right now for us, and they will last far longer than the next Christmas or the Christmas after. They'll go on into eternity. And so these songs provide this foundation that outlives and outlasts and outdoes on every level anything else that we could experience this Christmas. If our hope is in a season, we're in trouble. It is temporary and we will crash shortly afterwards or we will be disappointed with something along the way. If our hope is in the Savior, the Servant of God, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, then we are in great shape no matter what's going on around us, no matter what might be waiting for us around the corner as we enter a new year. Whatever happens or doesn't happen this season won't matter if our hearts are settled on on Jesus Christ. And so while songs of the season work on the surface and, and, and connect with our emotions and our feelings, songs of the Son point to the glory of God, peace with God through Jesus Christ, and the peace of God as we walk forward together. So let's prepare our hearts for those songs, the servant songs of Isaiah, by listening this morning to three voices and answering three questions that must be dealt with before we can get to those songs as we come to Isaiah 40. Remember, this is the turning point in the book. What we saw last time in chapter 39, and now in chapter 40, everything's now changing its focus, and it all starts right here. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40 this morning and begin here. And We look first at the need for comfort. Isaiah 40 begins, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Comfort, comfort my people. Maybe you're familiar with that piece in Handel's Messiah. Uh, I encourage you to, to sit and listen through a recording of Handel's Messiah sometime during this season. It is just scripture put to music and it will just lift your heart and focus you on the glory of God as you walk through that. I look forward to that time every year where we just set some, aside some time to sit and listen to Handel's Messiah. Well, here we have these words, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Now, this is loaded, and, and comfort was needed for so many reasons. Can you imagine Isaiah finally getting to say a word like comfort? He must have been pumped and excited to be able to write this down and record this. Uh, at his commissioning in Isaiah 6, remember when he saw the throne room of God and he said, I'll go, I'll take your message. And God said, you are going to deliver a message of judgment, of, of rebuke, and people won't listen, and you'll keep on, and they won't listen, and you'll keep on, and they won't listen. And remember how hard that ministry was going to be and has been through the years covered so far, uh, up to chapter 39? Oh, what a relief to be able to share good news, good news, and this message of comfort. Well, The people of Isaiah's day needed to hear comfort. They needed a word of comfort. They had just heard about Hezekiah. And we saw last time in chapter 39, verse 8, that Hezekiah didn't care what was going to happen to the people, to the city, to the temple, to the treasures of the people, to the the economic situation of the people, to, to those who would be killed, those who would be enslaved and taken off to Babylon. He just didn't care because it was going to happen after his lifetime. And as long as things were good for him, He was just fine. So they're feeling totally abandoned by this king. Can you imagine how that left them feeling? They knew that Babylon, they they just heard that Babylon was going to be coming for them next. They just got past Assyria, 
Now Babylon's coming. And when Babylon arrives, Babylon will bring with it 70 years of exile and captivity. Oh, they need hope. Is there any hope? They were wondering, has God abandoned us? They needed another message. In Matthew chapter 2, Matthew tells us, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, magi from the east came to Jerusalem. See that phrase? In Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king. That would have just sent a, sent a shiver down the spine of every Jewish person living in Israel who read that. Those days of Herod, living under Rome and living under the tyranny of Herod, their puppet king, who, who just ruled with, with anger and oppression. They needed relief. They needed, in the days of Herod, when Jesus came, they needed a word of comfort. Today, <clears throat> excuse me, today you and I, we need a word of comfort. We need a word of encouragement. So many people are discouraged personally and and they're dealing with financial issues and health issues and relational issues and tensions and all the things that just seem so heavy around us. We need a word of comfort. I know I do. Don't you? Of course we do. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater. To come. That's what Advent is for. That's what we're looking forward to, these words of comfort. And as we read these two verses, we listen to the tone. Comfort, care, concern. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tenderly literally means speak to the heart. Speak to the heart. This is just as an information. Reach out and connect with them. There, her warfare is ended. Literally her hard service. Babylon will not last forever. There is hope. Pardon will come. This judgment will not last forever. Pardon will come. There is help and there is hope to come. The need for comfort existed then. It existed in the first century when Jesus arrived the first time. It exists right now as we wait for him to come a second time. That's for sure. And so into this setting now come three voices. These are not the three tenors, but this is a Christmas trio that we need to hear. Here are the here's the first voice. Look at verse 3. A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here's the first voice, and this first voice speaks out to us and says, prepare for the work of God. Nothing will stand in the way of the exiles' return to Judah when he brings them back from Babylon. Nothing will stay in the, stand in the way. No obstacles will remain in the way of God's ongoing work for them and in them and through them. The old and the young will be able to travel back to Judah. The healthy and the sick will be led back. The weak and the strong will all have access to this rescue, bringing them back home. The valleys will be raised. The mountains will be lowered. What is that telling us? It's saying all obstacles will be removed. So prepare for the work of God. Prepare a way for him to make that happen. This speaks to the heart of the people of Isaiah's day as they were anticipating this 70 years in Babylon. There will be a day when God will deliver and restore his people and return his people. But this goes much deeper. Matthew chapter 3 tells us, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Matthew tells us, as do the other gospel writers, that this is talking about John the Baptist. So, it, yes, it's talking about the return from exile in Babylon, but it's going so much further. It's talking about the mis mission and ministry of John the Baptist. And what was he there to do? He was there to prepare the way for Jesus. The greatest, this passage then is looking forward to the greatest rescue and work and pardon of God for his people, and that is through Jesus the Christ. That's what's going on here. We, we need so to be so clear on that. That everything that we read in the Gospels 
is built on the word of the prophets, the promises of God. They are sure and they are certain and they are true. And as we study these prophecies and these songs of the servant coming up over the season, we can, we can rest assured they are rock solid guaranteed promises about Jesus. And that's what this passage is talking about. Yes, the return from Babylon, but also the delivery of God's people through his son Jesus as John made, made that call. Prepare the way. And how would they prepare the way? Repenting. Turn around. Turn 180 degrees. Return to God. Turn from doing things on your own. Turn from your sin. Turn from your selfishness. Turn from everything you've known and embraced. And embrace God. Follow him as his people. The call of this first voice is prepare for the work of God. And it's also to watch for the glory of God. In verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. In John chapter 1, John put the arrival of Jesus this way. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, God, who said, let light shine out of darkness when he created the world, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the full revelation to us of the glory of God. You want to know what God's all about? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. And so what are you doing this Christmas season? to prepare for the work of God. Do you believe God still has work to do in your life and through your life? Of course he does. So what are you doing? Are you turning your back on living on your own and doing your own thing and returning to the Holy One to say, I am yours, you are God, I am not. Continue your work to make me more like Christ. Remove what needs to go, bring what needs to come. Use me for your purposes and your glory. Are you preparing your heart are you preparing for the work of God and are you watching for the glory of God? Are you watching for his presence and his work even now as he makes you more like Christ and he allows you to share the good news of Jesus with others? Maybe you're listening and you have never surrendered yourself to God through his son, Jesus Christ, the only savior, the only rescue that we can possibly have and know and experience, the only way to be right with God. For you, the call that goes out this Christmas Prepare for the work of God. Repent, turn around, and humbly surrender to him and say, you come and you forgive me for my rebellion. You come and you take me from death to light, to life, from darkness to light. You come and place me into the kingdom of your son, Jesus. You come and adopt me as your child through Jesus. You come and bring me life. Voice number one says, prepare for the work of God. Voice number two, as we approach this Christmas season and the songs of the servant, says, stand on the word of God. Look at verse 6. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Are you trusting in people? People's promises, people's ideas and ingenuity, people's standards, people's invitations. What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in people? Are you trusting in yourself? Oh, well, today in our culture, we worship a lot of things. Our culture worships its stuff. Our culture worships our ideas and strength and rights and our own version of truth, whatever we cook that up to be. Imagine the people in Isaiah's day. They were, they were looking at Isaiah at, at Assyria, and Assyria would be gone. Now they're looking to head to Babylon. But what does this passage tell us? These verses tell us Babylon will be gone too. Where is Assyria? Gone. The, word, the, the Lord God blew on them with his breath, and they're gone like grass or flowers. Done. This, this mighty kingdom. Babylon. Where's the Babylonian empire that the people were living in fear of as they looked to the future? Gone. God breathed on it, and it disappeared. What about Rome and Herod in the days when Jesus came the first time in the first century there in Israel? Uh, where are they? Uh, gone. What about the West? Oh, that seems so mighty and powerful. It is on the way out. Can't you see it crumbling out from beneath our feet? The West is losing its finances, its power, its influence, its, its 
morality, everything. It is continuing to turn against God step after step after step. And you can see things lining up. The West is not going to last a whole lot longer. That's just the way it is. It's on the way out. When my children were small, they loved that, uh, that movie Monsters, Inc. Remember that? And in that movie, Monsters, Inc., uh, when there was a competition going on between two of the monsters and one was ahead, and the other one said, oh, you hear that? He said, no, what is it? It's the winds of change. We, we say that around our house every once in a while. Oh, you hear that? It's the winds of change. Well, listen, what you hear today as the winds of change around you may well be the breath of God reminding mankind that men are grass and 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 empires, no matter how strong they seem to be, are no better than flowers that are going to fade and, and fall away and be gone when God breathes on them. Everything people trust on falls apart and disintegrates, except for the Word of God. But the Word of our God will stand forever. His Word, His Word is the foundation for your life. His Word is the one thing you can trust and count on. Obey it. Matthew 7 says that Jesus told us if we listen to his words but also obey them, we'll be the ones who are standing rock solid on the foundation when the storms of judgment come. Christmas Trio, voice number one, says prepare for the work of God and watch for the glory of the Lord. The second says stand on the word of God. And the third says behold your God. Look at verse 9. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Voice number three says, Behold your God. Take another look. Stand back in awe at who God is. He says, Behold your God. And he says, first of all, that we need to stand up. And he says, Jerusalem, or o Zion, the herald of good news, herald of good news, stand up on a mountain and shout it out. Go tell it on the mountain. What? That God has come. This is like a messenger running back to the city with a report of battle. What had happened? People were waiting to hear. And it's like Zion, uh, Jerusalem, being the first to hear and to see and to experience what God has done and what God would do. And so they're now told to stand up and to shout and make it known to others. Share the good news. Relay the good news. Behold your God. And as we look further in this chapter, we see in verses 12 down to verse 17, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Who? Oh yeah, only God. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or who? what man can sh show him his counsel? Who has uh, offered advice to God? Who has God had to lean on for direction? Oh yeah, no one. Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Uh, all the nations are like nothing before him. They're accounted by him as less than nothing and, and emptiness. Voice number three says, Behold your God. Look again at the glory of God. And, and the question that comes first here of these three questions we must now answer is, Who is greater than God? The answer, nobody. Nobody. One writer has said, The gulf that separates the creator and the creature. The gulf between God, almighty God, the true and the living God, who spoke this world into existence, who reigns and rules supreme over every being, be it a spiritual realm or the angelic realm, be it people or creation, as we look at the world, nature, whatever it might be. The gulf between God and all that is not God is a vast and yawning gulf. If you do not engage in deep thinking, it may not seem so amazing. But if you have given yourself to frequent thoughtful consideration, you are astonished at the bridging of the great gulf between God and that which is not God through his son Jesus. Look at who God is. Behold your God. Who is greater than God? Be amazed again. Who's greater than God? No one. 
God has needed no advice, no help, no anything. And the nations of the world and all that the nations of the world worship there as nothing before God. Nothing. No one can compare. No one is greater than God. If God is not all-powerful, then his call, his promise of comfort is a trap. It's a deception. But friends, he is the one true and living God. And when he calls you to comfort and says, my hope, my help, my rescue is coming, you can bank on it. You can bank on it. Behold your God and ask this question, who is greater than God? Answer, no one. Look at verse 10. Behold, the Lord comes with might. His arm rules for him. His reward is with him. His recompense before him. Who is equal to God is the second question. He is the mighty God. And he comes with might. He comes with power. He comes to deliver on all his promises to rule and to reign. He comes to rescue. And, and his reward is with him. Uh, some um, scholars think that that's referring to the people that he has rescued and bringing along with him. They are his reward. Well, yes, but there's also this idea here, this reward is with him and his recompense with him, that he has come to rescue, but also to reward those who are faithful to him and to judge those who will continue to live in rebellion against him. He's here to reward and to judge. He is the mighty God. Who is like him? No one. Look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot and seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their, stern t uh, taken, is their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing? The second question is, who is equal to God? Answer, no one. Nothing that anybody worships around us is equal to God. None of the gods of the people of the world, whether it's actual idols that people worship, or whether it's things, or themselves, or ideas, and all those kind of things, no, nothing is equal to God. Nothing's greater to God, we've seen, and now he says nothing's equal to God. He speaks specifically here about the stars, which would have been worshipped in Babylon, and in those cultures around them, they worship the stars, the celestial beings. They, they would worship those things. And God, said, God put them in place. God's the one who keeps them in order. God's the one in control of those things. God rules supremely over all. He alone is God, and there is none to compare to him. He speaks of the idols that people make to worship. Really? You're going to carve something out of stone or out of wood and then bow down before it as though it's God? Are, are you kidding? But that happens all over the place. Pastor J.R. Vassar used to serve in Myanmar or Burma at the time as a missionary, and, and he said that one day they were on a prayer walk, walking around a large Buddhist temple praying for those that were trapped and enslaved in this false worship of this pagan false god, this, this image that's been carved that has no hope and no help attached to it, and that people's would, eyes would be open to the truth of freedom, of forgiveness, of life in Jesus Christ. And he said, as we walked around this Buddhist temple uh, praying for these people, he said, I noticed something that was incredible. A large number of people, very poor and desperate, were bowing down to a huge golden Buddha. They were stuffing what seemed to be the last of their money into the treasury box, and they were kneeling before this idol in prayer, hoping to secure a blessing from the Buddha. However, as he kept walking, he noticed that on the other side of this huge golden idol, scaffolding had been built. The Buddha had begun to deteriorate, and a group of workers was there diligently repairing the broken Buddha. He said, I stood back and took in this scene. 
broken people were bowing down to a broken Buddha, asking the broken Buddha to fix their broken lives, while someone else fixed the broken Buddha. He said, it was shocking. The insanity and despair of it all just hit me again. But he said, we're no different from them in our part of the world. We're broken people looking to other broken people to fix our broken lives. We're glory deficient people looking to other glory deficient people to supply us with glory. Looking to other people to provide for us what they lack themselves is a fool's errand. It's futile to look to other glory hungry people to satisfy our hunger for true glory and doing so simply leaves our souls empty. And yet that's what we do. And the questions come as we're told, behold your God, look again at the true and living God and ask yourself these questions. Who is greater than God? No one. Who is equal to God? No one. Not only is he better than everything else, there's nothing even compares that could be equal or in the same category as God. And since that is all true, the third question comes as we behold our God, then why am I discouraged? Look at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Why am I discouraged? Look at the heart of God. Behold your God. And look at the heart of God as we see in verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. He will come alongside and take the weak and take his people and collect them up to himself. And like a shepherd, he will tenderly care for them and protect them and provide for them and lead them forward. Look at the heart of God, our Savior, our shepherd, our shepherd. So why am I discouraged? There's no one greater than God. There's no one even equal to God. So he can handle me, and he can handle whatever I'm facing. Of course he can. He can be trusted. He who says he will be my shepherd. At Christmas, we hear a lot about shepherds. We, we dress our kids up like shepherds. We, we sing songs about shepherds. We see shepherds in our, our nativity scenes. We read about the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. And so it's fitting that we hear about shepherds. And as we do, we think of the Lamb of God and reflect on Jesus coming to be the Lamb of God, God's sacrifice for us to bring us back from our rebellion, to give us forgiveness and life. And while that is all true, we also need to understand that God is our shepherd. He is our good shepherd. And when you see shepherds and hear about shepherds and sing about shepherds and read about shepherds this Christmas, this Advent season, I encourage you to think about God, your true shepherd, our true shepherd. See the question that comes in verse 27? Why say my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? The people in Isaiah's day would have looked at Hezekiah, their king, and his attitude towards them and what was about to happen to them. They would hear the news of Babylon and they would say, what's going on? Has God done, does God not care anymore? Has he just walked away and abandoned us? The people in the first century, when Jesus came the first time, they were under the thumb of Rome. They were living under the fear of Herod, this tyrant, this maniac who, who, who was ru ruling Judea at the time. And they may well have asked, what's going on? Why has God forgotten us and abandoned us? Has he just left us on our own? What about us today? What about you today? What are you facing? What are you walking through that just feels so heavy and it's with you every day? It's what you think about when you're trying to fall asleep at night. It's what you think about when you wake up in the morning. It's what you talk about. It's what you worry about. When you're staring off into space instead of working, that's what you're thinking about. When your spouse is talking to you and you're not really paying attention, it's because you're dwelling on this. What is it that you're carrying? What is it that you're experiencing? What is it that you're afraid of that's just down the road? What are you looking ahead to in the next weeks and months and, and around the corner into the new year? What are you fearing and dreading? What, what, what is weighing on your heart? Friends, why say my way is disregarded by my God? Why has God abandoned me? Whatever we're facing, 
we know that there's no, no one greater than God. There's no one equal to God. God has promised to be our shepherd. And so we can trust him. That's Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Even though he leads me through the valley of the shadow of death, this dark, dangerous place that makes no sense to me and terrifies me, I won't be afraid because he's with me. He's got his rod to protect me and defend me. He's got his staff to keep me on track and to keep me on the way. And he's taking me through to that table land, that beautiful mountain meadow where he's going to meet my needs. He's taking me ultimately home and I'll dwell in his house forever. God is my shepherd. Jesus said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. He has come for us to shepherd us and to call us back to himself, to lead us home. He has come and he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. God, who is greater than all, God who has no equal, God who calls himself our shepherd, sends his son, the good shepherd, to lay down his life as the lamb for us as well, that we might be with him now through whatever we're encountering in this life and into eternity as his precious people his beloved people gathered up and carried along by our good shepherd oh friends is there anyone greater than god no is there anyone equal to god no and he is the one behold your god he is the one who's our shepherd and who loves us and cares for us and will carry us forward they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They shall renew their strength, those who wait on the Lord. That literally means to exchange strength, that renewal. It means I'm trading my weakness for his strength. I'm saying, this is, I've got nothing. And he says, I've got everything. Come and let me strengthen you, carry you forward. Friends, this Christmas season, this Advent season, Prepare for the work of God. Watch for the glory of the Lord as he works around you, as he shows you more of his son Jesus, as you study his word and as you walk with him and worship him. Look for the work of God. Prepare for the work of God in your own life and in the lives of others as you share the good news of Jesus. Stand on the word of God and behold your God. There's no one greater. There's no one equal. And he is, in fact, the good shepherd. And when you wait on him, he will renew your strength. Let these servant songs, the songs of the Son in the book of Isaiah, help you this season to remember the glory of God in the face of Jesus, to experience the work of God in the mission of Jesus, and to anticipate the rescue of God in the return of Jesus. Oh, that is good news for us. Help and hope is here. Let's worship the Lord through this season together and going forward and going forward with our hearts and our ears tuned in to be people who understand tidings of great of comfort and joy, people who can share tidings of comfort and joy as we point others to the true and the living God.